Okay, so good morning, uh, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the series of webinars that uh, the Meyer College of Education has been organizing uh, in the last one and a half months. Uh, in this uh, series of webinars today, I am delighted to welcome Professor Michael Sankey, who is the Director of Learning Transformations, uh, Learning Futures Department from the Griffith University, Brisbane, Australia. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us uh, for this webinar and uh, giving your precious time to talk to our students and faculty today. Pleasure. Uh, Thank you for having me. Right. Uh, so the topic of uh, today's webinar is uh, the changing nature of learning management systems and the emergence of a digital ecology. Uh, but before I uh, ask Professor Michael to give his presentation, uh, I would just like to introduce Professor Michael to all of you. So Professor Michael Sankey has over 30 years of teaching and research experience and his main areas of specialization are technology enhanced learning, staff and leadership development, curriculum renewal, online pedagogies, multimodal design, digital visual and multi literacies. In fact, some of these are some of the areas that our institution is also keenly working on. Uh, and his prime area is how constructively aligned and aesthetically enhanced learning environments can better transmit concepts to students, particularly those from diverse backgrounds. Uh, apart from that, Professor Michael is also the president of the Australasian Council on Open Distance and e called ACODE. He's also the director of the ACODE Learning Technologies Leadership Institute. He has been the vice chair of the Moodle Users Association and his previous engagements before Griffith University has been with Western Sydney University, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, RMIT, uh, University of Southern Queensland. He has published over 300 research papers, publications and conferences and is widely traveled and is one of the most sought after personalities, especially during these times of COVID when he is presenting webinars all over the world and participating in meetings and conferences. So I'm extremely delighted and welcome you, sir, uh, to this uh, webinar and hope and believe that uh, uh, we'll have a fruitful interaction with you. Uh, I would now uh, request you to take over the proceedings and uh, share your screen for your presentation. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hadith. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I've uh, done a number of uh, papers with uh, people from uh, the northern northern areas of India and uh, I have a fond a fondness for this area. Uh, I'll just share my screen uh, to start with. Okay, so it says here that uh, it's been disabled. So attendees can't share the screen. So you need to promote me. Just a second. Yeah. Can you check now? That's it, got it. Very good. Excellent, and that's coming through okay? Yeah, that's coming fine. Fantastic. So, uh, thank you again. What I'd like to talk through is uh, how we are seeing technology and the use of technology uh, change the landscape of higher education. Uh, we've seen a big shift, particularly in Australia, and particularly over this time of COVID-19, where we've had uh, a massive uptake in the use of technology very quickly as all our universities, uh, the physical campus is shut down. But this has only been, uh, the response to that's been quite, has been reasonably okay, because many of us have been dealing with uh, online learning for quite some time. And there's some reasons for that. So what I'd just like to share with you is uh, that our digital ecologies are changing because we're wanting to change the way we've been teaching. So the way we teach it has been changing. And so we're seeing a much greater emphasis being placed on things like active, authentic and collaborative modes of teaching, as opposed to just being presented information uh, that our students have to just consume and regurgitate in a sense. Therefore, if we want to do that, we actually have to find new tools to help us do these new tasks and to perform those functions. 
And that's why we've seen a change in the ecology uh, of our learning management systems, etc. Because the reason to engage with these tools is very much driven by the pedagogies that we want to uh, run with, that we want to exemplify. Right. So if we're going to use these tools, we need to make sure we have a sound pedagogical foundation for the use of those tools. So in this presentation today, I'm just going to talk a little bit to give you a sense of what Griffith University is like and where we, where we sit within the sector, our approach to technology enhanced learning, how we uh, are supporting that approach and uh, supporting our staff and students in that, the, uh, the important issue of how we quality assure our technology enhanced learning, and some uh, points around how we take a pedagogy first approach to this. Yeah. And then I'd like to provide some examples of some of that active, authentic and collaborative learning uh, that we do and some of the, the types of things that we can do when we think about this. And then uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about how we might want to share what we learn with others, uh, because we are not just islands unto ourselves, we are part of a greater community of uh, higher education workers across the globe and we are becoming far more global. So Griffith University, uh, you might see the map there of Australia and a blue dot on that map. Uh, I'm sitting in Brisbane in Queensland, state of Queensland and uh, that's known as the Sunshine State uh, because it has such a lovely climate up here. Uh, we don't really get very cold winters. I think the, the lowest we would get to in winter in Brisbane itself would be to about five degrees centigrade overnight. Mm. Uh, very rarely would we go any cooler than that. Uh, and we'll get up in the summer, we'll go up to uh, maybe 42 degrees centigrade. So it's a, not too bad, not too bad. Um, we are a large comprehensive metropolitan university. So comprehensive university means we teach everything from medicine through to visual arts. And uh, we have uh, four major academic groups or faculties uh, within our cohorts. Uh, we have about 50,000 plus students and we have six campuses, five physical campuses and one virtual campus. And you'll see here a simplified map of the Brisbane area. And so we, that blue uh, squiggly line, the meandering river there is the Brisbane River. And that divides the north and the south of Brisbane and we are in the southern side of Brisbane going right down to the Gold Coast. Gold Coast is where we have our Gold Coast Hospital and we are the uh, patrons of that hospital. And uh, so we, we dot ourselves up and down the uh, southern side of Brisbane there. Um, we have about uh, 15,000 students at any one time taking online courses. Now that they're usually enrolled as on-campus students, but are also taking online courses as well. And so we have a very strong history of blended learning and the use of technology in our learning and teaching. So as I said, 50,000 students, we have about 4,000 plus staff. Uh, we have 20 research centres, institutes and centres. We are ranked in the top 2% of universities in the world. Uh, we have uh, 200,000 plus graduates and 200 plus degrees. That is Bachelor of Business, Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Laws and things like that. So 200 plus degrees on offer. Um, we have a fairly sophisticated, I suppose you could say in, uh, globally, a fairly sophisticated uh, virtual learning environment. A virtual learning environment is made up of a learning management system and a range of other tools around that. So. We at Griffith have uh, a thing called Learning at Griffith, which is our Blackboard environment. It says they're Blackboard Ultra. Uh, we're in the transitioning, we're transitioning to Blackboard Ultra as we speak. We're on Blackboard 9.1 at the moment, but transitioning to Blackboard Ultra. Uh, around that, and interoperable with that, we have uh, a large instance of Office 365, Microsoft Office 365, which is uh, uh, the the online version of Microsoft Office, which controls our emails, our notifications, and it's a, it's a large ecology in itself. 
Now, across that, we share a number of other tools. Uh, Echo 360 ALP is a lecture capture system. We use the Turnitin plagiarism detection software. Uh, within, you'll see there, we use a, a product called Stream. That's for video streaming, uh, which is contained within the Microsoft Suite, and OneNote, again, which is contained within the Microsoft Suite. And over the right-hand side here, you see PebblePad and VoiceThread, which are other cloud tools that we utilize within our virtual learning environment. There are a number of, we have about, all up, we have about 30 tools, registered tools within our uh, virtual learning environment. Uh, we also have strong drivers, uh, use of, of OneDrive and of Teams. And Teams is a, uh, has been a major shift in the way we're doing learning and teaching over the last couple of years. Right. Outside yeah. that, we also have elements that we create using H5P, which stands for HTML5 package. So creating content uh, using HTML. Uh, we align a lot of what we do with things like LinkedIn and professional learning and professional attributes and have uh, agreements with LinkedIn in relation to providing professional development for students. Of course, we are strong users of things like YouTube and a whole range of other cloud systems as well. Across all this, we need to ensure that our corporate systems are aligned uh, and our data is aligning with these uh, major systems. And so we have a large IT and infrastructure group. Uh, we also use uh, Blackboard Collaborate and we're very strong in our analytics area as well. Because underneath, all we do now is this thing called data and uh, very much looking at how we use data to inform our artificial intelligence engines and uh, chatbots and things like that within our environment. So as you can appreciate it, that's, that hasn't come overnight. That's been a development over the last 20 years of uh, pushing into this uh, use of technology as a, as a major way in which to mediate our learning and teaching. What we are seeing uh, more recently over the last year or so, last two years, is we have our Blackboard environment and associated tools. And you see there across the top, I'm gonna to be talking about pre-university, our undergraduate studies, postgraduate, and the world of work. And uh, we do know in Queensland particularly, that our students, uh, our students in what we know as our public high schools, that is the ones run by the government, use Blackboard as well. And so we know our students and a lot of the younger students are coming in with a, an understanding of using a learning management system. Uh, we see that, of course, moving through to the postgraduate years. And to some extent, some workplaces use a learning management system to mediate their professional development. However, <clears throat> we also know that all our schools use a, the Microsoft Office 365 environment and the associated tools. And uh, we actually see that uh, the use of these tools superseding the use of a virtual learning, uh, the um, learning management system over the three or four year period. Now, the reason for that is once our students move into post-grad work and into the world of work, they're the tools they're gonna to be using more so than they're gonna be using a learning management system. So in a sense, it's up to us, it's incumbent upon us to be, to be preparing our students for the world of work. And the more that we can use the tools that they will use in the workplace, the more they're gonna be prepared for the world of work. And that also includes the other workplace technologies that I might use, uh, things like CAD for if they're an engineering student, if they're an accounting student, so it's MYOB, different, different software packages that they might use in their professional lives. This Office 365, and particularly a, a, a tool called Teams, is what they call a productivity tool. And it's what Teams is, a, is a, a tool that's being used by many major corporations to allow staff to interface with each other, uh, to create learning for them, and to, uh, to syndicate other information out to their groups. And so this productivity tool uh, in our particular case, every student has access to that and every staff member has that and we use it on a daily basis for the way we do business as well. So I 
I'm very keen on this notion of productivity and the students actually being productive right. from starting to be productive from the time they come into university. So by the time they get out of university, they really have to be productive for their employers. Yeah. And so the more we can train them to be productive and to communicate well with each other, the more we are doing the right thing by them in preparing them for the workplace. Right. So we see that we've seen some shifts over the last 10, 20 years in the way in which, particularly the last 10 years in the way we look at our things like the virtual learning environment, our, our learning management system, where previously we had what we called self or cloud hosted systems. That is systems that were housed within our own data warehouses or uh, something like uh, uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, but we controlled the software and the software providers uh, gave us updates every year or every six months and we applied those updates. But more recently, a lot of these companies, the technology companies have moved to a SaaS service, a software as a service. Right. So every client of the company is working on the same version of the software at the same time. And it's on a lar very large cloud service they host and a, a, a across different nations. Now, many of our learning management systems have moved to this SaaS service, the software as a service, and it makes the, uh, the process of upgrades and things very easy for an institution. It's not a cheap activity, but it actually saves money in the long run because we don't have a lot of staff managing the software uh, and having to be expert in the actual software itself. Yeah. We've also seen, because of that shift, uh, a shift from application program interface, API, that was sophisticated bits of code that had to be developed to make our systems talk to each other, to a newer type arrangement, which is called learning technology interoperability, learning tools interoperability. It's, an, it's a simpler code that makes these SaaS systems, these software as a service systems, talk to each other and interoperate and share information across in a secure way. And so that has opened the door <clears throat> for a lot of other providers to be able to interface with our main systems. Right. We also see, of course, that uh, the way in which we transmit information to students has changed. So where 10, 20 years ago, we very much lectured at the students. There was the, peer, the, the sage on the stage, the person who was the oracle, the, 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 the wisdom person, uh, who would be transmitting information into these vessels, which are students, and they had to basically be filled up. Uh, but we've very much changed that thinking to one of participatory uh, creation of information, where students are actually active in the development of their own learning, uh, with information, of course, still coming from the lecturer, but also the way they co-create and co-construct their learning which gives them a much more authentic experience of the learning process and the way they engage in that process. And I'll talk a little bit about that as we go further in. Sure. To do that, though, we've also had to move from what's known as a walled garden approach, where in the old day, in the old uh, days, we had a garden, there was a wall around it, and it protected us from the outside world. Mm -hmm. And that's how we saw our learning management systems, uh, that it was all the learning happened within that learning management system. Whereas now we start to see all these other systems and where I showed you that in that picture before of our virtual learning environment, where we're now having to and want to accept information and share information across these systems. Mm -hmm. And that's called an open garden approach. And so we've seen these changes evolve uh, from the earlier days, the antecedents, and now the descendants of this are these newer versions of our systems. Now this allows us a whole lot of opportunities, uh, not the least of which is the way in which students are already connecting and communicating with each other through other social media forms and things like that. Right. However, it's really important that uh, we don't lose the notion of quality within this uh, because we start to lose a little bit of, we perceive we start to lose a little bit of control when we start to use a whole range of systems, when students start uh, learning together and uh, the lecturer is not in charge of everything, mm -hmm. there is this perception that we're losing 
about on a bit of quality. So in Australia's case, uh, we have a, a, a group called the uh, Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency. And they have very much given us uh, firm guidelines in terms of technology hence learning and what that means for universities and the guidelines that they have to adhere to uh, in relation to technology hence learning. And it's aligned with uh, what they call their standards. Right. So uh, they've started to take a very big interest in TEL, technology hence learning, and uh, how they, how institutions particularly, they want to be sure that the same standard of education is happening for a student who is online as who is sitting in the classroom. And mm. so they're very much, they're very keen to ensure that that same level of learning happens. Right. Particularly for those fully online courses, which we have quite a few of. So they introduced this back in April last year, this technology hence learning guidance note, and have given us a, a grace period to, for all the universities in Australia to bring themselves up to speed. Most universities up to speed. Uh, there's a number of what we call private providers in Australia who haven't done a lot of online learning, who are now starting to move into online learning. And this is important for them to be able to have a period where they can uh, raise the standard for themselves. Right. Uh, of course, we've had to move very quickly in this space, particularly with the COVID, all the COVID-19 things happening. Now, this of course varies across various areas of the globe. Um, and so there are levels of technology and learning seen across that. And it's very much based on uh, educational jurisdiction. Uh, so, uh, you know, national technology infrastructures, geographic constraints and things like that. So for example, in Australia, we have what's called the national broadband network. And so most people in Australia have access to very fast broadband, but that's not the same in all the parts of India, it's not the same uh, in many uh, of the other Asian countries or in Africa, for example. So there are different ways in which we think about technology enhanced learning. So at the, at the, the fundamental level, we have a, a concept called technology enabled learning. That is the use of technology just to enable learning to happen. And that could be through simple systems. I know in your case, you use Google, uh, I believe, to, to mediate your learning, and yeah. that's great. Um, and it's, it's, that enables students to get online and to do some things. We then have what we call technology enhanced learning. So it's, we've gone past that stage of enabling and now starting to look at all the different tools that we might use to enhance learning even further. But there's a third stage in this too, this technology intensive learning. Mm -hmm. And it's where we're starting to use artificial intelligence, bots, AI, uh, um, uh, uh, 3D immersive spaces and things like that, uh, which is fairly new in the, in the, in the area of education, uh, but we're working uh, very much, uh, particularly in Australia, to, to start to understand and how to harness uh, some of the affordances of this technology intensive learning. Right. If we do that, well, there's just kind of, particularly in terms of quality, there's this hierarchy of needs. It's like in a, an adaption of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Whereas we have at that meta level, so the high level, we need to have things like institutional policies and procedures in place if we're around technology hence learning. That's imperative. So at the very base level that controls this notion of technology hence learning institution, we have these procedures and policies. At that point then we need to then translate how that relates to individual courses and units that we might study or uh, might provide. And so there is this framework that allows for the levels of study, the levels of where students are at first year, second year, third year, et cetera, and what types of things they should be exposed to, what their level of um, information literacy should be in their, and their digital literacy, et cetera. And then at the micro level, at the smaller level, there are standards that we have across all our courses, our baseline standards. So every course, whether it's online or not, needs to have some standards in place. I'm, I'm gonna make sure that you know, these students are experiencing a minimum set of activities. Right. And there are also standards around online courses to make sure that, for example, if, if a student is studying full-time and he's studying full-time online, 
that each time they go into a new course or subject, they are going to they know where to find where the assessment information is, or they know that they're going to be able to click on certain things to find the lectures and things like that. So there's some standards around that and the use of inclusivity within that. And then of course on the right hand side, there are different activities that can happen that will make will help us make sure those things are in place. And so at our institutional policies and procedures level, we see that there is an alignment to things like uh, sector-wide standards to the external bodies. In our case, TEXA, the Tertiary Education Quality Agency, that we have play things in place for inter-institutional benchmarking. So we're not just doing this in our own bubble. We're also doing it with other institutions within the sector. And we can share information uh, with those uh, to understand where we sit within that within the, the realm of technology and learning in this particular case. That means we might facilitate self-reflective activities within our institution and look at our, how we, as an institution, implement these benchmarks or standards. And I'll talk very briefly about that in a minute. And then there, of course, the way we align our uh, professional development, our PD, our professional development around these things and create the resources for that. And then, of course, how we help people you know, whether they call up or, come, or send us a web request or send us an email in terms of getting support for their technology hands learning. Right. So one of the right. tools I'd like to expose you to briefly is the benchmarking toolkit for technology enabled learning. Mm -hmm. It's a toolkit that I developed uh, with Sanjay Mishra from uh, Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, and it's a toolkit to help institutions understand where they stand within the, the realm of technology enabled learning. So bearing in mind, this is the technology enabled learning area. So designing to help institutions see their, their practice in the light of what is considered good practice across that sector and helps them then to, if they do that, to help them to compare this with others and then to take advantage uh, of the style of quality assurance uh, that will provide this institution a richer experience. So at the end of the day, we're hoping, hoping that you will get a, a richer experience for applying a tool like this. This right. can be accessed from this URL and uh, I will provide these slides to you so uh, you can uh, click on these as you want. There are within this 10 domains. So there's, there are benchmarks around policy, strategic planning, the use of IT, uh, technology applications, uh, the development of content, uh, the, the way you document that, uh, the organizational culture around the use of technology, uh, leadership structures, human resource training, and also uh, how we might use champions uh, around technology enabled learning as well. Right, excellent. So these domains are basically indicative of, and you don't necessarily it, they, they presume that you're on the journey. They don't say that you have to do this, this, and this. They presume you're on a journey towards completeness in a sense. And uh, there are different levels in there that help you do that. So each benchmark has uh, four to six performance indicators. I won't go into detail on that at the moment. I'll leave you to be able to download the document yourself and have a look at it to see if that might apply uh, in any way to your institution. It might be a good way to get your uh, foot in the water, your toe in the water, as it were. That's at the institutional level. So we're looking at technology and learning at the institutional level. Then there's a whole range of different tools across the globe that are used to look at that course subject level. So in, at Griffith, we call a unit or a subject a course. Yeah. Um, and we call the bigger thing, the Bachelor of Arts a program. Anyway. Other people call them subjects, other people call them units. There's a notion that there is, a, there is quality that needs to be had at that individual course unit subject level. And there are a whole range of tools in the, in the sector that can help you do that. Uh, in Australia, we have a tool called the TELAS, the Technology Enhanced Learning Accreditation Standards. And uh, Griffith, we are implementing uh, that tool uh, to ensure that the individual courses that we run in our learning management system, in our virtual learning environment, uh, do uh, adhere to some quality standards. But there are a whole range of these standards out there uh, if you're interested in looking at those. 
at that, you might remember at that very base level, I talked about there was these base level for all courses and they're co and we have those called our course design standards. So those previous ones I showed you that tell us was for fully online courses, but this is our base level. This is our course design standards and our standards uh, talk about the way we have partnership based learning. And this is, this is one of the things that drive the use of our technologies, which see our students, very much as partners within the learning journey with us. Right. And so we need to have standards around what that looks like for us. We like to think in terms of uh, engaging with empowering pedagogies. And I'm gonna talk through some of those, the active, authentic, collaborative pedagogies. I'll be talking about that with you in a minute. Then there is scholarly inspired curriculum. So the curriculum that we use uh, and design is for is based in research that uh, it's not it's evidence-based practice and so it's how we see uh, what we've done how others have done it and done some kind of uh, analysis of why that is a good way to do things we also then see that we're not as i said earlier in a bubble we are part of a global community a higher education community and we know that we are uh, educating stu our students to work internationally, not just locally. <clears throat> and so it's very important that we have standards around that. Also in terms of uh, learner-enabled design. So where, how much we allow our students to uh, work with us in that design. Uh, then there is, there is some uh, talk happening in the background, which is a little bit disturbing. Uh, so, if you could mic mute your microphone, that would be very yeah. handy. Yeah, yeah, I'll just uh, check on that. Somebody is just accidentally probably yeah. their mic. So that is uh, what we call digital enabled learning, and that's where we get into this space of the fully online course and how we then translate that through into our online courses. Of course, since we've had this COVID nineteen, COVID nineteen, just a second. All all our courses have had to go online very quickly. So where we had face-to-face -face teaching, uh, we had lockdown scenarios and we all had to teach online very, very quickly. And so it was very, it was incumbent upon us to ramp up professional development very quickly of our staff. And so uh, what we've seen uh, and what we've done is over the last six, after the last six weeks, we have, we have, run on average 11 workshops a week. Uh, and over the last six weeks, we've had 1400 staff participate in those workshops. It's an astonishing uplift. And we're starting to see, and we'll see some longer term benefits come out of this COVID in the way that our staff are uh, prepared now to teach online. Right. Early on, we started talking about how we're getting lectures online quickly. And then we start to shift our focus to alternative forms of assessment and different models of teaching. And now we're starting at this point, six weeks in, uh, we're now starting to talk about the way we uh, design for our next uh, trimester, semester, and then uh, the analytics that might underlie the, the courses that we're using so we can learn from the data we have. Right. So to do all this though, we start with this notion of a pedagogy first approach. And I published a blog today that I've left a link in here for you. It's based on an article I wrote for the, the Distance Education Journal of China. Uh, now, this is an English version. And I've just posted that on my uh, blog site today. And I've got a link for that in here. Uh, what I'm going to distill out of that very quickly is some points uh, that you hopefully you might find helpful in terms of thinking about the way we've evolved this digital ecology and the way the types of things we can do in this evolved ecology. Right. Um, and so we are thinking in terms of education using technologies, but based on pedagogical scenarios. So we've tried to fit pedagogical intent into our teaching using a tool like a learning management system, because we like that tool but instead we need to be using the pedagogy as the reason for adopting the tool. So if we're thinking about engaging students in collaborative learning, there's a range of tools that we can look at for collaborative learning and we want to find the best tool 
to mediate and help us do that collaborative learning. So though we might have a preferred tool because we like the tool, it's not necessarily the best tool. So there's some, there's some work that needs to be done by institutions that are deciding which is the best tool to help them do that. Right. Because if we don't do that, we're putting the cart before the horse. Kind of like this. The technology can't pull the pedagogy. It's got to be the other way around. Right. So right. technology doesn't hold all the answers for it, but it does hold quite a few. And uh, as we look to see how we evolve uh, this, we're going to look at some examples and we're going to look at how this has evolved over time over the last 20 years or so. So when I did start in education 30 years ago, in higher education 30 years ago, we were talking about pedagogy and andragogy. Uh, andragogy, pedagogy being just the way in which we learn and teach. Andragogy is the way adults learn and teach. And then we started to think in terms of hutagogy, which is how uh, we start to think in terms of the co-creation of, of knowledge a bit um, through constructivist, constructivist pedagogies and things. And now we've moved into this area called paragogy, which is the way in which social interaction starts to interface into learning. Now, all these concepts are still alive and well. It's not a hierarchy here, but they're all things that we need to consider as we start to design our next generation learning. And these are called the isms and the odds. I like to call them the isms and the odds. You've got the pedagogy, andragogy, pedagogy, paragogy, and then we've got the isms, which are the, the learning behaviours, the behaviourism, the instructivism, cognitivism. These are all terms that have emerged in the literature over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and of course, the, <clears throat> the, the bottom one there being constructivism, which is the way in which we co-construct knowledge and social constructivism. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to unpack there. They're unpacked a little bit in that article, which I'm going to give you the, the link for if you would like to, if you're interested in that moving forward. And here's the, here's the article. It's called Putting the Pedagogic Horse in Front of the Technology Cart. And uh, there is a link to that there. It's on my blog site. And uh, I'll, as, you, as I've said, you'll, you'll have a copy of this presentation. So you'll be able to get that link from this presentation. I also put it up on LinkedIn today, if yeah. you're on LinkedIn. And uh, if you search for Michael Sankey, you'll be able to get to that link. It's on Twitter as well. There's my Twitter handle down the bottom in the middle. Uh, it's also on that today as well. Right. Let me just look at three concepts very quickly, active, collaborative, and authentic learning. And uh, that will take us up to question time. Active learning. Active learning is where we engage students in an analytical level. So that is, it seeks to facilitate students to assimilate materials and information rather than passively absorbing them through traditional lectures, etc., and just reading documents and things. So we do this by designing tasks that require students to be active. So active learning, active. They are also being encouraged to take a deeper approach to learning, uh, can impact the way in a, they learn in a positive way. So what would we do if we're doing things like that? We would do make sure we're doing active discussions and encouraging students to be discussing concepts with each other and sharing things with each other as they learn. So it's not just the teacher sharing what they think, it's also the students sharing together and actively engaging in that learning. It, it's about using live debates. So either in the classroom or in the virtual space like this in Zoom, it's about having students debate the concepts that you might give them. It's around putting problems up and having them solve the problems and sharing the answers and co-sharing the answers. It's about providing them a case study and asking them to work through the case study. It's about using simulations. Uh, there's lots of different simulation engines out there that can be used. It's about role playing. Ask a student, put them in the place of being a manager of a company or um, uh, the manager of a gallery or whatever it might be, or a teacher in your particular case. Uh, you're teaching a, a year 10 class and you're teaching mathematics. Get them to role play how they might start the day, for example. And then, of course, peer teaching, how, each, how they are working with each other in a peer. So getting them to uh, mark other students' work. And they, they might mark two or three other students' works and two or three, other, and student, two or three students are marking my work. Right. And I will learn 
I, in, in me marking three other students' work, I'm not only learning what I've written, I'm also learning from what they've written and the different ways they have seen the same problem. Right, right. And then there are things like team projects where they're starting to work together as they would in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Then there's collaborative learning, which is there's some, there's some similarities to active learning. And that relies on engaging group structures to supporting students working together. And usually involves two or more people in those things, allowing them to capitalize on one another's skills, just like we talked about before with the peer thing. And it's how we integrate this teaching program to encourage students to become more involved in, their, in the learning. And so what we might do is look at peer modeling, getting students to role play. Now we saw role play and active learning as well. Some of these uh, cross over, but it's the way in which we design this. Uh, we might design an online scavenger hunt if we're in the online space, asking them to find uh, different sources of information. Uh, so if, if we were to give them a challenge to find out what hudagogy was, let them go and find out what hudagogy was and bring that back to you and the different sources to which they, they think they've found. Uh, there's also uh, more informal debates on a given topic. There are uh, what we call past the problem activities, where we, we have a problem, we pose a problem to the students, they partly answer it or give the answer as best they can, it then gets passed on to another student to add to that. Uh, we can also uh, form groups creatively where students brainstorm solutions to problems. Again, uh, group type work as well. Then let's, uh, the last one here is authentic learning. So students gain experience uh, by learning by doing rather than just by listening and observing. That's a common, common known fact now in, in, uh, in Australia, at least, that you know, students learn better by doing. Um, so let's let them discuss, explore and construct concepts uh, around real, real world relationships, as it were. Many of our students also work up to 25 hours a week uh, in many cases and study. Uh, so it's encouraging them to critically think and evaluate information and to build uh, a professional identity, basically, and exposes them to various settings and activities uh, and opportunities to collaborate. It's giving them those opportunities to collaborate and to practice their skills in these various environments, these virtual environments. So what does that look like? It looks like uh, we give them an ill-defined problem and uh, ask them, and it's not easily solvable, and ask them to work as a group to, to uh, really nut out that problem. Um, it might mean a sustained investigation. So it might be something you're giving them at the beginning of semester, trimester, the term or whatever, and it might take them 12, 14 weeks to, to get to an answer. Uh, it might be allowing them multiple sources and perspectives. So there are different answers to this, this problem. There are, different, there are different groups of people who've answered this problem in different ways. What do you think is the best way and how could you back that up? Might be asking them to reflect, uh, might be giving them perspectives from different disciplines. So if you're in education, but you might want to, to say, oh, okay, well, what do you think an engineer would think about this? Or a visual artist might think about that. How would a visual artist represent this differently to what you do as an education student? And then there is assessment that's integrated. And so uh, in, in many Western countries, we talk about constructive alignment. And that is that our learning objectives are very much aligned to the assessment and our graduate attributes. And there's an alignment between that. So we know if we're passing this assignment, that we're, we're meeting this, this um, level of standard within the course, this um, attribute, and that that's gonna, that's gonna form part of us as the, uh, this full suite of attributes that we as a graduate will attain. Uh, it might be through the creation of products that you, you're asking to build something and uh, uh, look at many different problems uh, and solution. Uh, so uh, some solutions might have multiple outcomes and so uh, all of which might be right. So importantly though, and this is where things like ACODE, which I'm the president of come in, we're all in this together and uh, ACODE, I should have said up front, was it's a representative body. So I represent Griffith and there's another person that represents Griffith, there's two of us, but I'm the, I'm the main representative. And each university in Australia, New Zealand and Fiji 
so the Australasian area, have a representation on this council. It's not an association that anybody can join to council. So each university has a representative and I'm part of that. I'm also part of the Ascolite network, which I, I will talk about in a sec. But uh, we're all in this together. And we as university directors of technology hence learning, which is basically what each representative is, we, uh, we are people who are willing to share with each other because we know we're all in this together and we want to actually learn from each other. There's no secrets really. We can go and find any of this information anywhere on the internet. Right. Uh, it's a matter of how we're applying this in, in information in our own cases. And so it's about getting connected to those people and finding organisations and, and, and uh, professional bodies that you can connect with around this. But looking for people you can trust, that you already know. As uh, lots of people are putting stuff up on the internet, as you know, you can go... Uh, Lots of fake news on the internet, lots of different things on the internet that just are not, are not right. Uh, any any Joe Bo, any anybody can put. I mean, I put up a blog post today. How do you know that my blog post is accurate? You, you might. The only thing you can do is trust that you know, I've got a good profile across the sector, and because I've got a good profile, I'm not going to be putting up rubbish. But anybody else could do that. Anybody who hasn't got a good profile could put information up on the internet. So you are looking for people and things that are trusted sources for your information. So a number of the groups that I'm involved in is, is what's called the, the Tell Advisors, the Technology and Learning Advisors. It's, a, it's an online group and they have a blog and we have uh, uh, presentations every month and things like that. I'm also a member of Ascolite, which is the Australasian Society for IT and Education, as it were. Um, which is a not a council, it's an association. So anybody can join Ascolite. There are also major uh, uh, bodies like JISC, which is the Joint Information Systems Group in England. And EDUCORS, which of course is the American version of that. And they're continuously publishing excellent bits of information around technology hence learning and things. So I've, uh, I think I've used up my time and we've got, uh, probably 13, 14 minutes for questions. Yes. And so I've spoken enough now. And <laughs> it's probably time uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, open up for some questions. So thank you very much, Michael. An excellent presentation. We got to know so much. In fact, uh, many of things that you shared, uh, we are doing some part of it, uh, probably in bits and pieces, but would love to you know, collaborate and consolidate things at our end. Uh, mm -hmm. I really loved your presentation, the way you started by giving us an idea about uh, Queensland, Brisbane. Uh, and although I've been to the Sunshine State uh, and I know I love the place like South Bank in the CBD. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, obviously Gold Coast, which is full of um, the most beautiful beaches in the world and uh, yeah. also has wonderful theme parks. In fact, probably up north in Keynes, we also have the Great Barrier Reef, which is the only natural resource visible from space. So yeah. excellent things to see and learn in Australia. Um, mm -hmm. I love the notion of the three tells that you, uh, you know, uh, uh, prominently uh, shared in your uh, slide, which is the technology enabled learning, the technology enhanced learning and the technology intensive learning. Uh, uh, we are also at the stage of the technology enhanced learning and would love to see how the intensive part is happening and AI is being used proactively in education. And then... Yes. Uh, the concept of the authentic learning, the collaborative and the active learning. Uh, I mean, uh, it was a great, great learning experience. And I'm very glad to uh, say that students have some excellent questions for you. Uh, so the first, uh, I'll just like to start with one question because I've seen across uh, most of the Australian universities that they're commonly using this platform called Oasis and Blackboard. So mm -hmm. is that an Australian thing or we can, you know, use it in India or uh, is it, you know, like more uh, prevalent in other countries as well? So uh, there are four main providers of learning management system. The, the four main providers are Blackboard, right. uh, which is an American company okay. uh, that are very active across the globe. There is Canvas, okay. which is also an American company. Uh, which is uh, a newer system that is more the next generation learning management system. Right. There is Moodle, which is an open source system. Right. And many institutions in India and Africa uh, use Moodle. I used to be the, 
vice chair of that international users group. Yeah. Right. Um, and Moodle is a very good product. Uh, and there is also a product called uh, Desire to Learn, D2L, which is a Canadian product. Okay. Uh, but it's probably, if you're going to pick those, it's it's probably the, the lowest in the rung of the four of them. So um, <clears throat> at this point, um, Canvas has been making some inroads into the market. It's a fairly newer product and many a number of institutions have moved from Blackboard to Canvas, mm -hmm. but others have stayed with Blackboard because they're, they're very familiar with it. Right. At Griffith, we use Blackboard. Right. Uh, at three of the four institutions we've, I've worked at, we've used Blackboard. Uh, at uh, University of Southern Queensland, where I was for quite some time, we use yeah. Moodle. Okay. Moodle, is the, Moodle is the second most popular right. uh, learning management system in Australia. Or and Australia. Capabilities and features as Canvas and Blackboard? Uh, yes. yes. Right. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll ask uh, our heads of the departments to uh, kindly start asking the questions that students have posted. I'll request Professor Moolraj to start with. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I'm directly co coming to the questions that uh, the first question was that what is the reason behind shift from walled garden approach to open garden approach? Okay. Uh, so I think the reason is because there's, mo there's multiple reasons. Uh, but one of the major reasons is this notion of, uh, was brought about by the, the advent of social media and the, the ease in which it is, how easy it is to share information and to gather information and to share information across systems. And so the technology in this case is allowed for a shift in the way we think about knowledge and the way in which we can garner knowledge and the way we can share knowledge. And so uh, where previously the, uh, there was this mystique that the lecturer knew everything, as soon as information became more open, right. we found that lecturers hmm, maybe didn't know everything. <laughs> and that uh, there was other information the lecturer didn't know. Uh, surprise, surprise. Uh, so, <laughs> I put myself, I, I taught for many years uh, and I thought I was the, I knew everything, but obviously I didn't. Uh, and so uh, that's the way it's come about. And so the more we start to find that there's other information that can uh, increase our knowledge, our, our knowledge bank, uh, the more those doorways open between uh, that closed space that we, we thought was sacrosanct but now there is other information. Yes. Right, great. Uh, Dr. Ramika? Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, sir. My uh, next question is, uh, well, uh, it's a very uh, good question, rather. I'm also feeling to ask this question. Are there any good metrics and indicators to measure learning in virtual learning environment? Yes, so uh, to gauge the amount of learning, you mean? Or to, so, in terms, so there are those standards, of course, which I mentioned before, which make it possible to make the approach to learning more consistent. So for many years, students in surveys have been saying, we want more consistency in the online environment. The more consistency we, we can provide, the, we lower the barriers for students in terms of being able to access information and share information. Right. So that makes it easier for us to then start to measure the amount of learning that's happening because we don't, we can take out of the, the equation, those things that uh, would cause confusion and things like that. Uh, in terms of metrics for learning, that is very much based on uh, the, uh, the, uh, evaluations that we do, not just of assessments, I'm not just talking about the assessments our students do, the assignments our students do, yeah. but in terms of how they are responding to us through what we have, what we call student evaluation surveys. So evaluations, students evaluate us on our teaching mm -hmm. and they also evaluate us on the environments they're learning within. Yeah. 
Right. And so <clears throat> there's some correlations between uh, marks and uh, uh, evaluations, and of course the consistency of the environments themselves. So there's a three, there's a triangle in a sense uh, of data uh, that can be used to actually start to chart what effective learning looks like. Oh, yes. So do we have any questions from uh, Dr. Nishta or uh, Dr. Monica? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, my question is how to give practical exposure to students through virtual teaching, especially uh, in the subjects where practicals are very important uh, uh, to be done by the students. Yes. Yes, you mean you mean particularly this time with the COVID thing and things like that. You're yeah, talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> that is a, This has been a problem, of course, for everybody across the globe. Uh, what we have we have done as uh, we've inst we've obviously that can't go. So I should say we are every every program that we offer has what we call work integrated learning involved with in it. So. There are work experiences for the students for all our programs. Uh, the same as, a, as a, an education student goes into the classroom and starts to do that. But every program we offer, so in nursing, in business, in architecture, in medicine, of course, every program we have has work integrated learning. Now, in many cases, that work integrated learning hasn't been able to happen over the last couple of months. Right. So we've had to look at other forms of work integrated learning. Right. Uh, and participation. So what we've done is we've worked very closely with the, the companies that would normally uh, uh, have our students and we've asked them to continue to have our students but to, for those students to work virtually with them, which is what we're doing right now and what we do, all our university, all members of our university are working from their homes at the moment. Uh, none of them in, uh, Hardly any of them are in the institution itself. So we're all working from home. Um, and I'm working quite effectively from home. And uh, lots of businesses are working quite effectively from home. That's one thing. So there is still virtual work that can happen that can be considered work integrated learning. There is then the notion that we have, uh, uh, we have started to do, we've been doing it for many years, but we've up up the ante in terms of simulations. So workplace simulations. So we've used 360 degree cameras okay. and taken them into workplaces with appropriate social distancing, 360 degree video, uh, and have done walkthroughs for students to prepare them for when they actually do get into the workplace. So when they go into the workplace, they don't have to learn everything about their workplace straight away. They've actually been exposed to that beforehand. They can be exposed to health and safety information. They can do quizzes around that. So things that they would do when they go to the workplace in a physical sense, and they would have to go through these workplace safety procedures and things like that, they can do that before they get to that place. Right. Uh, through these virtual tools. And so we've developed uh, a number of tools that allow that to happen. Uh, the other way, of course, is to, uh, which is not as satisfactory, of course, is to get students to uh, virtualize that experience. So asking them to, in a sense, imagine that they're in the workplace and write reflections on that and uh, uh, share that with the companies or with people who have been in the workplace and those people giving feedback to those things. So yes, uh, it's not ideal, but uh, until we can get back into those workplaces, uh, they're the kinds of, they're three of the things we've been doing to help us do that. Right, great. Yes, uh, Dr. Monica. Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, my question is, uh, as TEL is an effective way to effective learning, but somewhere it also uh, creates hindrance in the overall development of human beings. What do you think? Now, I didn't quite get that because of the echo. Does anybody get that? Echo. TEL is an effective way to effective learning, but somewhere it also creates a hindrance in the overall development of human beings. 
So I should you say, does TEL affect you know uh, development of the students or in the in the overall development? Oh, okay. Uh, is that right? Uh, so, uh, what we, there's a there's a, a very significant there's a there's a lot of research around which is called the no significant difference research, right? Uh, which is uh, widely publicised now, uh, which which suggests that in many cases technology enhanced learning can provide better results than face to face learning. Mm -hmm. Now that's given uh, appropriate situation, uh, appropriate circumstances are in place. But uh, we're finding in Australia at the moment that, for example, all our schools have been closed. And so our teachers within our schools have been using Zoom and other tools to work with their students. Right. Uh, and provide, and they all have used this, our virtual learning environments, that you know, the, the Blackboard and the Office 365, to run activities within those environments. Right. Now, in terms of this latest crisis, we have the research isn't in yet, but there's strong evidence to suggest that many students are performing quite well in these environments. But historically, uh, and particularly across higher education, uh, technology enhanced learning uh, has allowed for a greater level of flexibility for our students. So they can actually do things like work and study at the same time and use those work scenarios that they're in towards their study right. uh, as real life examples and things like that. So um, the, in many cases, because technology enhanced learning is predicated on the thought that there are uh, chunks of knowledge that are scaffolded uh, throughout the course of the trimester or, or term, makes it harder for students to miss things. So where a student might be sitting in a classroom and the, and the lecturer is talking to them, they can tend to miss things. But in the technology and learning space, uh, it is there for them always to go back to. Right. Uh, and particularly as we do recorded lectures and things like that, there is more opportunity for students to engage with the information in a consistent way. And that's where the standards come in, making sure that those things are all in place uh, in the right places for them to actually access. Yeah. All right. So, Dr. Mulraj? Uh, there are many questions which are related to LMS and uh, virtual learning environments, uh, as well as DEL. So, uh, uh, they want to know about that, but uh, they want to know that uh, uh, what, what is the, you can say, simple meaning of these terms and uh, how are they, you can say, different from each other and what is their significance uh, in the uh, coming time? Yeah. So when I talk about the LMS, that is a learning management system. It's a system. It's one system. Uh, just like an e-portfolio is a system, like a lecture capture system is a system. Uh, they are like Facebook is a system, like LinkedIn is a system. They are individual systems. Now, uh, a learning management system is a system that mediates a, a suite of activities that are consistent with other system well, like systems. Mm -hmm. So the four learning management systems I mentioned before all have very similar functionalities and they're known as learning management systems. Right. Now different so a virtual learning environment though is a lot of those systems together mm -hmm. working together. So it would be the LMS, the ePortfolio, um, the lecture capture system that make up the virtual learning environment. So the virtual learning environment is that meta, meta way of thinking about the, dif the different systems working together. Right, excellent. Yeah. Um, Dr. Ronika? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, in terms of national technology infrastructure, how to bridge rural urban technology infrastructure gap in the present time? Yes. I was hoping you'd tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you must have issues uh, in Australia. I have, uh, <clears throat> so I, I know for a fact that uh, not every Indian student has a computer. Yeah. I do know that majority of Indian students have mobile phones. Yeah. And uh, internet enabled mobile phones over 3G, 4G, next G, whatever, 5G, whatever networks they are. Um, the trick is in, of course, rural India is making sure that the cell towers are accessible. 
mm. uh, particularly in the more remote areas. Right. Um, I was when I was at the Commonwealth of Learning Conference in in um, Edinburgh uh, uh, in August last year. Uh, there was this fantastic project that was being done in India by an Indian uh, in the in the up very north in the mountain areas where he had trained up where he had training up women to be wireless technicians mm. wireless engineers mm. and they were putting in their wireless technologies throughout the throughout the different towns a fantastic project and it was allowing these people with their mobile phones to be able to connect to listen to lectures and to read information. So many of the new learning management systems and many of the new software as a service systems have uh, what we call um, responsive design in them. The responsive design means it's a web page, but once it's looked on, to, uh, on a mobile phone, it reshapes itself for the mobile phone. Right, right. And so <clears throat> responsive design is, is perfect for learning. So those systems that are responsive allow us to uh, create learning environments suitable for the mobile phone. Now, suitable for the mobile phone is audio content. Right. It's some visual content, but the use of audio, particularly around assessment, we're using the mobile phone is very important. Right. So why does a student have to write a paper? Why does a student have to type a paper? Why can't they speak out the paper? Why can't they use the audio functionality of their mobile phone to do that? Why can't they take a picture, use a video, to create a video of what they're doing with their mobile phone and present that as their assessment piece? It doesn't have to be written. It doesn't have to be, uh, so long as they're making the right connections to the literature that they're doing, uh, they can speak it out quite happily. Right. And it can be marked. Uh, there are new technologies associated with voice recognition to actually say, well, that is that student doing that work. Right. And so there are patterns of speech and things like that we can use uh, to, to, val to verify the, the use of that. I mean, it's no different if a student, if students are going to cheat, they're going to cheat. And yeah. so uh, <coughs> the, 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 the ways we think about being able to defend against cheating is to be able to give them uh, personalized learning experiences. So where they have to personalize what their learning is. So it's not just um, verbatim route. Uh, here's what this journal article said. It's somebody could, it's, it's allowing them to put themselves in a situation and to demonstrate how they've done something. Now, the perfect way to actually understand that is through audio information, not necessarily through writing. Right, excellent. Yes, Dr. Nishta. Uh, yes, sir. sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Sir, uh, uh, without any doubt, we can say uh, that technology enabled learning is an aid to effective learning. But sometimes it is uh, also creating a hindrance in the overall development of human beings as humans, especially in COVID 19 times, uh, where the average screen time for the parents, for teachers, for students has been increased significantly. Sir, mm. please uh, throw light on this. Yes. Um, that's quite true. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's important, uh, particularly with, uh, with our children. Uh, my children have all grown up. I've now got grandchildren, but uh, that they're not, that their relaxation time is not then on technology. So it's being able to ensure that they are uh, enough breaks from the use of technology. Right. So that, uh, you know, take them for a walk, go to the pool, something like that. But it's, it's getting them off that technology. They've had enough time on their technology doing their schoolwork at the moment. They don't need to be then going playing games uh, for the rest of the evening on their, on their uh, technology. Uh, so uh, we as parents need to mediate that. Uh, me as an adult, that's a different story. So I need to be doing other things as well. I need to be modeling good behavior for my students, for my kids, my grandkids. And so um, uh, technology, uh, anything taken in excess, anything done to excess is not good for you. So we need to, particularly at this time, be very conscious 
uh, that we're not overdoing our use of technology. Uh, right. It is yeah. not healthy. So we just have uh, time for maybe one or maximum two questions. So uh, if Dr. Monica Bajaj has a question. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, question is uh, like, can active and collaborative learning through online mode be as effective and interactive as in the classroom? Yeah, thank you. Uh, with particularly, well, it depends which tools you're using. So that's why the, the pedagogy has to drive it. And so there are, uh, one, of the, one of the tools we use uh, to do this in is, a, is that tool called Microsoft Teams, uh, where students actually can form virtual teams. Uh, within that tool, there is a tool like Zoom that allows them to talk with each other very easily and it's integrated into the system. And so this is uh, particularly, uh, as we're all working remotely at the moment, we're all using these tools and we seem to be working quite effectively yeah. uh, in groups and, and things like that. So it's the same situation as study situation, whereby students are uh, exposed to different work scenarios. They're exposed to uh, different ways of working together. It's not the same. It's a little bit different, but it is just as effective, um, particularly given this is probably not the only pandemic that's going to come our way. Uh, I think we can assume that there's going to be others that will be in the future. And so this is a way in which we need to be thinking of working in the future. We need to be thinking that it's not necessarily all going to go back to the way it was. And so we need to be making the most of what we're going through now to learn lessons so that we can take them forward uh, and provide uh, new ways of interacting with, our, with each other and with the, the people we're teaching. Excellent. So just one last question then, Dr. Mulraj. Uh, yes, sir. Sir, uh, it is related to educational research that uh, uh, what is the significance of uh, the changing nature of learning management system in educational mm -hmm. research? Yeah. Um, there's the, a lot of the literatures are based around uh, different elements of this. So it's the rise of, uh, for example, learning analytics. And so there are different fields of educational research people specialize in. The learning analytics is one. Uh, the use of AI is another one, artificial intelligence. Uh, it's, there's the, of course, the use of uh, virtual reality and things like that. So lots of different streams of research are happening in relation to education. What there isn't so much of yet, which I'm quite keen on, is how these are working together and pulling that, that meta picture, the bigger picture of this into uh, the way we're thinking about it. So that illustration I, I gave you of those bars going crossways, this is starting to think through in research terms, how we're changing the way, how we've evolved uh, these processes. So really a lot of the, pre some of the presentation today is very early thinking uh, in terms of how these systems have evolved. So they've just evolved. Right. Um, just as, uh, just as the coastline evolves as, as tides come and change it. Right. Same with education. Right. Uh, the right. tides affect the way we do things. Right. And so uh, we need to be, conscious we need to be able to take points in time and look at what it was then what it was no that might be 20 years ago might be 10 years ago might be five years ago might be now and look at the way in which we can chart that change and what are the what are the things that have caused that change to happen right. it might have been storms yeah. it might have been uh, droughts and so in and it, um, metaphorically i'm talking of course uh, so to these different activities, so the changing from uh, hosted systems to SaaS systems, it's the changing of different approaches to learning. It's, yeah. So it's these things that have evolved, which are causing this evolution of systems. Right. And, it's, and it's that it's us wanting to do things differently that are right. causing these yeah. systems to change. Uh, there hasn't been a, a, a great deal written on that particular topic. I'm hoping to do a lot more writing on that over the next little while. So wait for it. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> we'll be doing that. So, so <laughs> that's what we've got time for today. Uh, thank you so much, Michael, for doing this for us. Uh, excellent uh, questions asked by the students and uh, equally good responses from you. It's been a great, great learning experience for all of us. Uh, we would, you know, love to have a look at the benchmarking toolkit for TEL so that we could benchmark our institution as well and to yes. see where we are as compared to others uh, around the yes. world. And then we would love to collaborate with you on future projects and also, uh, you know, take your help in improving the use of technology in our institution. Uh, in fact, we also bring out a journal of education. So we've just completed uh, 10 volumes of that uh, journal. So we just do yeah, two wow. yep. a year. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's been accepted pretty well now in the educational circles. We would love to have you on the advisory board of the journal as well to see how oh, okay. we can improve the quality yeah. of the journal further. Uh, and I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to thank the faculty members of the Meyer College of Education uh, and the students of the postgraduate department, the MPhil department, uh, and the undergraduate department of education to join us on this lovely webinar. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Hope to see you in a new webinar soon. Thank you, Michael, once again. Yes. Thank you a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all. Thank all 145 you. of you. Goodness gracious. Yeah, so they've dropped because of uh, you were talking about connectivity. I would just like to say that in our state, which is actually going through a little strife tone process, we only have 2G connectivity of uh, mobile phones at the moment. Yes, right. So, well. so, so, so it's a little difficult to get students connected uh, on the network. Uh, but still, they've managed. We, we had a maximum of 210 participants. Yes, very good. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. Then, that's then, wonderful. So this yes. recording will go on our YouTube channel for more students to see. Thank you very so good. much. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye for now.